My people, welcome back to another great episode of your favorite You and I talk show with Luis Uacho. Tonight, we're talking sex again, okay? Stay tuned. My people, welcome back to you and I. This week we have Maureen McGrath. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. Maureen, you were so popular. <laughs> You're back by popular demand. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> On top of that, you've written a book since then. Yes, I have. You are so busy. I mean, I saw you speak at the TEDx. I saw your article in the Vancouver Sun. You've written books. You've been speaking everywhere. Like, how is the journey of writing a book? This is a whole new thing, right? Yes, it's interesting. You know, I was advised by many people to write a book, uh, mainly as a business card on steroids. And, uh, and so I started the process. I, it's all been a journey. All of this has been from the beginning of the clinical practice to holding public forums to my desire to get education about sex and sexuality and healthy sex lives out to the public and to the people who really need it. And so this is just another venue, another, another way to get the information out there. So This is another way to teach. That's right, yes, because sex is like a secret society. <laughs> Everybody's doing it, but nobody wants to talk about it, yeah. except for me and you, of course. Yeah. Oh, I found you. <laughs> uh, but uh, so it's, you know, we're, sex is shrouded in shame, and people are uncomfortable about it, and they have different degrees of comfort for them. So I see so many patients in my clinical practice, and I have for about 15 years now. And so I decided to put together a collection of stories that are common stories that may have presented it to me in an unusual way, but uh, that can help a lot of people. And uh, so everything from sex addiction to infidelity to online dating. Yeah, I love how you wrote the book. First of all, it's a collection of stories, but it kind of makes a whole, you know, so you can read a, a selective chapter or you can read the whole book. It would still make sense anywhere you catch the book. That's right. And I would like to stress that, that these are anonymous tales. Yes. So Nobody's uh, name has been mentioned. No. And names have been modified. They have been. Otherwise, I want to know who's the woman, who's the 70-something-year-old woman <laughs> who's getting her groove on. <laughs> The names have been changed to protect the innocent, and in some cases, the guilty. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a collection. I've read a couple of stories of the guilty, too. <laughs> yeah, so it is a collection of, uh, of cases as well. So it's not necessarily one particular person. I've used a little literary license here throughout. But, but these are very common sexual health conditions, sexual dysfunctions and disorders that people can relate to and may say, that's me, because everybody thinks they are the only one that has a particular problem, especially around sexual health. Yeah, and so the thing that you're doing is you are really tying sex to health. Yes, it, it is actually a health issue. Mm -hmm. And many people don't view it that way. But no, no sex not at is, all. Is, it has nothing to do with health. No. Nobody but it, even it, thinks about health. It <laughs> makes us healthier. And it's, and it's a health issue. I had a patient recently, she could not experience orgasm ever. She never has. Well, she had a couple of other vaginal health conditions, one skin condition, she had lichen sclerosis, she had vaginal dryness, and also vaginal atrophy. And she didn't understand self-exploration and the importance of that in terms of reaching orgasm or experiencing orgasm. And so she, at you know 45 years of age, uh, needed to understand how the female sexual response cycle worked, how her body worked, she needed to explore, and that's a couple of health issues were interfering with her ability to experience orgasm. So I even said to her, this is a health issue, you can see this. And, and she said she, she was so ashamed, it took her 20 years to actually get help about this. Yeah. At which age does somebody actually become comfortable with this? Because it seems like it takes such a long time, but one thing that you talk about in your book is that sex can be at any age. So people don't have to get desperate if they, their 20s are over. Right? That's right, no, you know, and, and <laughs> people reach a level of comfort at different stages of their life. And that really depends on their upbringing, 
any religious education, any issues with gender identity, genital mutilation issues, history of sexual abuse or trauma, uh, their own sense of vulnerability, their own self-confidence, their own body image, uh, you know, sexual expression. So there's so much that's related to that. And it's really once you come to accept yourself and you become fully comfortable sexually and with self-exploration and knowing yourself and the ability to be vulnerable, you don't have to have sex with somebody else, that's nice, but uh, you can have sex with yourself. And so getting comfortable with yourself, as I say, if you can't touch yourself, who can you touch? Yeah. But <laughs> uh, so also being vulnerable and so being in a trusting, mutual, consenting relationship Relationship is also very helpful. So there are many things that are tied to it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that you spoke about at the TEDx, by the way, congratulations on your TEDx talk. Thank you very you much. You were so amazing. You were dressed so nice. You owned the entire room. <laughs> you walk up the entire room. According to me, you could have closed the show with a bang, like yeah. you say. <laughs> You'll have to wait for the YouTube video yeah, to understand we'll what that have means. To wait. <laughs> and one thing that I have to uh, thank you for before we go for the break is that you did put your TEDx talk uh, in the book. You That's did right. include it. Like, who gave you that idea? It's such a great idea. I did. Well, I just thought of it at, yeah. the, at yes. the end. It's so brilliant. You know, well, there's information in there, and that's my passion in life, is to get this information out to people, out to men, and women, and everybody else, everybody, so that they can make informed decisions and, and live life to the fullest. Yeah. And so I really, it's, that's just what I do. I, I blog, I tweet, I post on LinkedIn, and my, I feel like I have this golden nugget of information about sexual health and, and it really needs to be shared and people need to, to learn it and know it because often people are not educated about sex because their parents may have been ashamed about it. Yeah, it's definitely our parents' fault. Okay, we'll be back, my people. <laughs> I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at watcher.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back and we're still talking about sex. You and I talk sex. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that you spoke about that I really like is um, the sexless marriage. So people are supposed to be having sex in their marriage. And then the thing that you said is that sex before marriage is actually not good for you? Well, it may be a contributing factor to the sexless marriage. Today we're having sex on average about 10 years, 10 years before we get married. And sexual boredom, and women actually report more boredom in the bedroom than men do. So sexual boredom is a contributing factor to a sexless marriage. And let's define sexless marriage. It's actually sex less than 10 times a year, however <gasps> one defines sex. So we associate we, uh, sex with marriage and we think all these married people are having so much sex. They are having more sex than single people, but overall about 20% of married couples meet the criteria for a sex sexless marriage, which is sex less than 10 times a year. Mm -hmm. So you see the correlation between having sex before marriage and having a sexless marriage? I thought that was like a, a religious thing. I was like, that's the Catholic side of Maureen. That's the Catholic side, <laughs> absolutely. Don't have sex before you get married, yeah. anybody. Yeah. Many women receive that message. Many women receive that message and they also are told sex is going to hurt. It's going to be very painful. You're not going to want it. So once they do get married, eventually, and it may be in an arranged marriage or, or a fix-up, which is fine, but um, they, they then are afraid to have sex because they think this is going to hurt. But that message, message was only given to them to prevent them from having sex prior to marriage. Mm. So for people who are having sex before marriage, you know, often people in relationships, they may want to get married, but they enter into a marriage and they're not having sex that often. Most brides don't have sex on their wedding night. So it shows you that it's lost its sacredness somewhat. Because they already know each other. 
they know each other quite well or perhaps one of them got incredibly drunk. It doesn't mean that much. It's all about the party. We're having really expensive weddings these days and, and the focus is not necessarily on the nuptials. And, you know, it's, it's become, we become lax in our sex lives. And, you know, sex is the tie that binds. It's very important in a marriage or in an intimate relationship. And, it, and I say it's the number one important. Finances are the most contentious issues in a marriage and, and sex is number two. But I think you should switch it around. It. <laughs> <laughs> of importance. But then again, I am a sex expert, so. <laughs> I know that term was so perfect. The sex expert term. I think it fits you so well, oh, sexpert. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so which brings us to the question then, um, once you're in a marriage, like you say, men and women are different. Um, so are you saying like monogamy is good for men, but it's not good for women? Because you said that women, in your book, yes. women actually are the ones who want var variety a little bit more. That what does that mean for monogamy? So being polygamous may actually be a good thing for us. Well, it's a very complex issue. And uh, it doesn't mean you don't have to pay attention and, and perhaps shake things up in the bedroom. Women are taught to dress up and, and role play, but men aren't really taught that. It's really the women that are doing that. And so it's not necessarily a case for polygamy or, or infidelity or, or cheating. It's just really, um, because that intimacy, that sex, it, it binds you. And so becoming more uh, playful, more flirtatious with one another, you know, work through foreplay, make it happen, make it to be very important. We're spreading ourselves so thin today. We're working in and outside of the home. We're doing the lion's share of the housework. So women are exhausted, the number one reason for low sexual desire in couples. But it doesn't mean that men can't get low sexual desire either. They will get it as well. But it's just that men are happy, in general, having sex. Okay. Just well, having, having sex. sex. The whole switching <laughs> up things, yes. thing. They, they don't, don't really care about that. Not really that much. But they like it, of course. They love the role playing. They love the dress up. They love anything. They're very visual. And that's arousing. And so that's great. But they're ha happy having sex with one person. Once they stop having sex with one person, that's when the problem occurs. So when there's low sexual desire, desire discrepancy in a marriage, or in a relationship, and somebody may decide to go outside of the marriage and actually um, experience infidelity. So no sexless marriage is immune to pornography, chronic masturbation, stress, infidelity, and divorce. Yeah, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty serious issue. Yeah, and, um, but the one thing that you talk about that's interesting is that you say the fantasy is good and you actually encourage people on fantasizing. Fantasy is key. Uh, I thought fantasy that you're not fantastic. even supposed to admit that you're fantasizing. Like, how well, can you be? I with didn't one say tell your partner fantasize. that you're thinking about oh, okay, the neighbor. No, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say go that far. Okay. But thinking about somebody else, you know, it's impossible to be attracted to one person for your entire life. We're living forever these days, and so of course you're going to find somebody that else that you're attracted to, whether it be uh, online or at work or in the supermarket or, you know, the baseball coach. I've heard it all from women that women who say they never, ever thought they would cheat and in fact judged other women for cheating would say, I never dreamed that the baseball coach would come along and, you know, throw me up against the wall and I'd have the most passionate kiss of my life. So people don't expect that. So you have to establish guidelines that govern those moments when you are struggling by someone's attractiveness outside of your marriage because it can be a big deal breaker infidelity or cheating and we all cheat everybody cheats well you know not you and I of course <laughs> I mean people are cheating I have no there. idea what you're it's, talking about it's very <laughs> Guilty. No. Uh, you know, cheating is common, is, is my point. Yeah. And, but there are reasons for it. And it's interesting, you know, some of the statistics around, around cheating. But it's really oftentimes about the sex. Or people get to a stage and they say, is this it? I really haven't lived out my sexual expression in the way I've wanted to. And then they may go down a different path. So. All right. Let's take a short break and come back and see how we can cheat less. You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at 
to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back and we're still talking about health because you said sex is about health. And we're, the, the uh, subtitle of the book is Why One Can't Come Without the Other. So you're saying you cannot be a healthy person if you don't have a healthy sexual life? Well, not necessarily. Some people choose not to be sexual. Some people are asexual. And so, what is that? So that is really, you know, they may want to date. They may, uh, uh, they're just not attracted to another person sexually. So there's just, they, they have that decreased or no attraction. So no desire to be sexual with another person. Mm. So, uh, and many people are like that and they're very healthy. And many people choose not to have sex and they can be very healthy. There are many ways to be healthy. Exercise, uh, eating properly, getting adequate amounts of sleep, cutting down on alcohol, minimizing alcohol, substance use and abuse, drugs, um, recreational drugs. So all of that, stress, not managing your stress, so all of that. But when you, re at orgasm, you release endorphins, they're feel-good hormones, it ha actually helps you to sleep better, it's been shown to reduce pain, increases mood. Uh, so it's a great thing in terms of uh, living a better life. But also many of the sexual dysfunctions or disorders, if people are bothered by them, are related to health. They have an, uh, an underling of health uh, association with them. Mm -hmm. And so let's get to the very touchy thing, which is sexual abuse. Yes, it's a very common, common issue. I tell a story in the book about a couple who had not consummated their marriage. And uh, many, uh, I, actually that's the one I told at uh, TEDx Stanley Park. But I, in, in the book I tell of a story of a woman who I spoke about somebody else anonymously and she said, I know of what you speak. And she had been abused sexually by her brother when she was a child and she was still financially dependent on him as an adult. And she went through just a nightmare of sex addiction, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, you know, lots of problems mm. and then eventually got married. But um, it really sets men and women up because uh, men, boys and girls are both sexually abused or experience unwanted sexual advances and it really sets them, sets them up for a anxiety throughout their lifetime or less than pleasurable sex or issues around sex. And many people marry other people unwittingly. They don't know that that partner, that person they've fallen in love with has actually been sexually abused as a child and that will impact or that may impact their sex life. Wow, so this is like a conversation that you encourage couples to have? I believe it's a very, it's, it's a very important piece of information that you need to know before you marry somebody. You know, a lot of religions and a lot of cultures teach do not have sex before you get married. And Which is good for you because it's going to make you have a sexful marriage not to have sex before you get married, but that's yeah. not the important question. Mm. I mean, and, and there's also a case for understanding each other and being compatible sexually, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's more important that you are sexually compatible than what kind of a car the person you're marrying is driving. And we often care about that more yeah. so today, that they fit the bill or, or tick all the boxes. But really, sexual compatibility and the ability to be vulnerable and perhaps advance together and learn together and you know have a great sex life, that that is really important. But isn't that like a trick situation? Because how are you supposed to know that you're sexually compatible with the person if you're not going to have sex before marriage? Well, you have to have sex before marriage. <laughs> Did I just say that? The Catholic nurse? <laughs> the Irish Catholic nurse? Well, it, it's a, you know, it's, it doesn't mean you have to have sex before marriage. But what I'm saying is you if you want to have a healthy sex life after marriage and you've decided as a couple not to have sex for whatever reason before you get married, that's a very important question to ask your future partner. Okay, is. should you at least see each other naked? Well, it, it, you know what, everyone makes their own decision and every couple makes their own decision. They come to the table with whatever education they've had or whatever, or whatever comfort or whatever religious teachings and whatever works for them is really what they should do. Mm -hmm. And body image, you bring up another issue, body image is a big issue in terms of satisfying sexual events. Now the researcher is coming out in me. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so the, the way a person feels about their own body. That's right. 
how they look, how they feel. I often say, you know, can you get naked? Do you feel, can you strut your stuff? They say, well, what does that mean? Throw on a pair of pumps, walk naked down the hallway. And, you know, some women can and some women can't. And, you know, it's when you, so they want the lights out, they don't want to be touched in certain areas. Women will obsess about a little area on the thigh or their stomach, and they won't, won't want that touch. So it's, it's, uh, it impacts many couples in many different ways, but nobody talks about it. Nobody yeah. will say that. And so then they come into my clinical practice, and it's a reservoir to talk about it in confidence. I'm never going to tell anybody. I might write a blog or a book, but I won't. <laughs> I'll keep it anonymous. And, and these are common issues, and so it makes other people feel that much better. Wow. Okay, we're going to take a short break and come back and keep talking about it, my sexy people. When I talk show with Louise Wachu, we love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at watcher.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back. So how does one heal from sex abuse so that they can go on to have a great sex life? Because I'm thinking that there's a healing. It's not always going to be there. And another thing that you said in your book that was so crazy for me was like the abuser apologizing does not help the victim. No, I, uh, you know, first of all, it's a journey. It's everyone's individual journey, and it's a lifelong journey to heal from sexual abuse. What's, what I find is helpful, and what I, ha what I have found has been helpful for my patients, has been those who do better were validated. The sexual abuse was validated. It was not a secret shame, so from a very young age, if it was the boyfriend of the mother, then the, the mother broke up with the boyfriend, said, this is not on, believe the child, and their healing is easier. You mm. know, it's, it's much better. Yeah. So validation is key. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want an apology from their abuser, especially if it's somebody in the family, and it often is. Yeah, or like they, you said in your book, the, the, the woman wanted an apology from the brother and recognition from the mother that she had suffered that. That's right, and neither one of them were going to give that to her. The mother couldn't even admit that it ever had happened, so yeah. the mother was in denial, and denial is a drug. So it's really something then that the person has to take hold of themselves and understand if they're having problems in life, issues that with jobs or with their relationship or with anger or uh, substance abuse, substance, ex excessive substance use, that it may, and they have been sexually abused as a child, that addressing that, they don't have to be so afraid uh, to address that, but everybody takes their own time when they're going to address that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a matter of I always say putting the problem on the table and mm -hmm. dealing with it and processing it, going through it, having confidants that you know reiterate that this is never your fault. This is a problem with the abuser, with the perpetrator. That's the person who is evil, who has a, a serious mental illness or serious darkness. So whether he says I'm sorry or not. That doesn't change anything. What if he actually says, I'm sorry? What does that do to the victim? Well, it's, it's disappointing in a way because it's really not going to do anything. It's not going to change anything. Yeah, for the, the person. abuse is there. And so that's why the person, yeah, has to work on themselves. Process the pain. Go through the grieving process. Deal with it. Talk to trusted individuals. Work on their successes. Take, you know, slowly get more comfortable, especially sexually, if they're in a particular relationship. And, and really try and differentiate between, because women who have been sexually abused feel that sex is dirty, or that they hate sex and they want nothing to do with it. I had a patient one time who was raised by a man who uh, sexually abused him as a child, and he thought, he was very confused as he, as he entered adolescence because he was attracted to women, and yet he was being abused by a man at home, and he said, well, the normal way, whatever normal is, there is no normal, but the way I'm supposed to be having sex is with men, and why am I attracted to women? So it, it sets up confusion for people in a big way. Oh, my goodness. Um, so to end this on a positive yes. note. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, let's. Uh, you have stories in there about sex and, and at any age, and you even talk about retirement homes. People are getting their groove on in retirement homes. They, it might be the only place they're getting it on oh! is retirement homes, <laughs> if I, if you ask me. But um, you know what? Sex never ends. People often say to me, "When does sex end?" And you know, thirty-five. They'll but say. But we're under the impression that all people are not doing anything. When, when does it? They're it doesn't too get tired. Are they physically capable? It, it gets. Um, <laughs> Um, it never gets turned off, you know, it, oh, it, right. and there's always attraction. I have 90-year-old patients who are in relationships. They may have trouble finding things down there, but uh, <laughs> as one woman said, I really wanted to have sex, she said, but I couldn't find his penis. <laughs> so I wrote a blog about her. But, um, you know, if sex never ends. We're sexual beings from cradle to grave. And, you know, what happens in the middle is we actually have to shake it up. And I do give some tips on how to get there. Um, my famous silver balls and some, and, you know, really use your imagination and fantasy and, and realize how how great you feel afterward and how much it bonds you to somebody and how much more rested you are and you look seven years younger if you have sex just twice a week. You look on average oh, seven years younger. that's the prescription? That's the prescription. People, where's my camera? <laughs> <laughs> twice a week if you want to look seven younger. Seven years younger on average. Seven that's years right. younger. And it relates to mood, so it's really good for I you. gotta get started on this thing. And, and make it important. So many people say, if I never have sex again, it won't be too soon, or I'd rather mop the floor, or, you know, and it's really sad because it can set up big problems in a relationship or in a marriage. So No limits. No limits. Whatever you're comfortable, it's mutual, consenting. It's good for you, it's healthy, and we need to start talking about it. We need to start re-educating about it. And, and women enjoy sex. It's okay for women to like sex. I hear so many times women will say, well, I don't want them to think I'm promiscuous. And I think, well, I don't actually have that word in my dictionary. You know, women, it, it's okay that women enjoy sex. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet we have this secret shame that if, oh, if a woman will say, if I enjoy sex, people will think poorly of me or th they'll think badly of me. Yeah, we think only porn stars are the ones who are supposed to enjoy sex. Like regular people are not supposed or men. to have that much fun with it. Right, or men. Yeah. You know, men, we're just, you know, racking them up, baby. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but women, you know, are, are often slut-shamed for enjoying sex. And so until we say, you know, I enjoy sex, it's okay, it's healthy, it's good for you, and we start talking about it openly, things are never going to change. So I'm trying to do that a little bit. <laughs> All right, Maureen, thank you so much. Thank you it's so much. It's been short. It's an absolute pleasure. I don't pleasure. know, right? We need to keep going. I, you'll be <laughs> back because the people love you so much and you have so much great information. Oh. Any last word that you want to throw out because we're done. <laughs> sex is good for you. Sex is healthy. Get back to the bedroom really quickly. <laughs> All right, my people. Sex is good for you. I'm dressed in, a, in my nurse outfit you're, today. You're pure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go have some. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.